God bless you today. I'm so glad that you came for step two of our Father's House growth track. We're glad that you're here and we're excited that you are looking into the church. You're finding out more. You're going to need to come on the on-ramp uh, to find out what we're all about. We like to do this up front in the beginning. Uh, we've seen people do this through the years where you might attend a church for a long period of time before you find out what they believe, how they lead, what is their approach to ministry. Uh, and what a sad thing to spend months of your life and then later find out this is not a fit for me. So we want to try to tell you up front how we lead the church, uh, what we care about, what God's called us to do in our city, because we want you to be a part of that. This is not uh, a ministry where one person does everything. We believe that we're here to equip God's people for the work of the ministry. And so we want you to find your place in the kingdom and do what called, God's called you to do. So last week we talked about being a follower of Jesus and about that really depends on having a vibrant relationship with God. So important, your entire spiritual journey begins with your relationship with God. So step one is follow, following Jesus. That's in your blank. Step one is follow, following Jesus, uh, following Him in baptism, following Him uh, as our Lord and Savior. Uh, this is this uh, part, this part of growth track is about connecting. So the word is connect. Connecting with the church, connecting with uh, fellow Christians and believers in the church. And this, so you know the goal, that's where we're headed today. At the end of this class, we're going to give you an opportunity to become a member of our Father's house. So we want to give you enough information so you can decide if this should be your home church or not. Uh, and I always like to begin... Uh, this step by telling a little bit about our Father's house. Uh, I've been the pastor here for a long, long time. I know I look young, uh, but I've pastored this church for over 25 years. And so uh, we're glad that you're, you're joining in. Now the church has gone through uh, many, many changes through the years. It actually started in 1968. And so everything that you see here, all that we've been able to do really is we've built on the foundation of someone else over the years. God has invested a lot in this region, and he has done so through this church. And so a, a few years ago, three churches came together in this area and decided to leave their identities behind and become one family. And we decided that that house should be called our Father's house. And so that is what has happened. And so we merged three churches together, and we have continued to grow in the knowledge of God and believing God for even more in the future. So uh, please go to your booklet and turn to page 23. That's where we're going to pick up today. Our Father's house purpose. It's important that you know that and that you understand our church and the vision of the church. If you came uh, last week to uh, step 101, then this will be a little bit of a review. Uh, if you're coming in at step 201, uh, really important that you go back and do 101 to get that part. Uh, but we're going to begin here. Look at your notes. We believe God always has had in his heart, in his deepest desire for his people, to take this journey, a spiritual journey. And the first thing, write this down, the first step of your journey is to know God. Know God. Remember last week, this word doesn't mean just mentally know him. Uh, it means to experience him. It means to know him intimately. God wants a personal relationship with you. He wants a real relationship. That's the first step. And that's what last week was all about. The second thing is God wants his people to find freedom. Write that down. Find freedom. That's blank two. Find freedom. All of us have areas in our life. We've got hurts. We've had things that happen to us. Things that hold us back and keep us from experiencing God's best for us. And so we want to lead you on a spiritual journey to find freedom. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute. Uh, because uh, that's really what this class is all about. The third thing is we believe God has for every person, He desires for you to discover your purpose. In other words, you need to know why you're here. Not just in our church, but on the planet. The great day of your life, the first greatest day of your life, the day you were born, the second greatest day of your life was when you discover why you were born. And sadly, many Christians, many people, Never find it out. They live and die and never find their purpose, their God-given design. And that's a tragedy. And so we want to do something about that, right? And that's what next week is all about. You need to come back for step three. And the fourth 
thing that we do is a culmination of the first three. At first, we want you to find, we want you to know God, find freedom. We want you to discover your purpose, and then you can do what you really, your life was really all about, what your purpose is really all about. And that is the third thing, write this down, is to make a difference. We believe this is your, your spiritual journey. So today I want to go back through uh, the four steps one more time just to show you how we here at our Father's house have organized ourselves around helping people take these individual steps. So turn to page 24. How do we help people know God? Well, primarily, we help people to know God on Sunday, right? Sun, that makes sense, right? Like, duh, the yeah, pastor on Sunday, right? So write down in that blank, Sunday services. It's very important. You might be thinking, that's just obvious, Pastor, because it's a church and most of the time it happens on Sunday. But actually, this is an area where we may be different than some churches you've gone to in the past. I grew up in a church where uh, really church was about church people. If you came in as a new person, you were like confused for a while. And really, if you got saved, you basically got saved in spite of all the stuff that was happening. But here, we believe that the church should be the most inviting, welcoming place on the earth. We believe that the church should be the safest place for all people. Every person, no matter where their background or where they're coming from, when they come into this place, it should be a place they are safe, they feel accepted, they feel loved, they feel cared about, they feel welcomed. In fact, our church, if, you, if you're looking for a church that is just about you, or just about the church person, this probably is not going to be a great fit for you. Uh, you may not enjoy here as much because Sunday is going to be designed to reach the person furthest from God. <laughs> That's our goal, is we want to create a space where people who don't know God can discover Him, can find Him, can encounter His love, and their lives be changed forever. In fact, it's very important if you have this vision that it's all about you, uh, <laughs> then you're not going to like uh, the fact that you have to look for parking. It's crowded right now. Or you have to look for a seat if you come to first service. Shh, don't tell anyone. There's plenty of seats in second service right now. Right? <laughs> uh, it may start to bug you that you have to walk a couple of blocks if you come late uh, to find a parking spot. But if you have the vision that Sunday morning is about reaching that person that doesn't know God, then after a while when we say, okay, we need some of you in first service to move to second service, or if we start a third service, they're like, okay, we need help in starting a third service, uh, you're going to be like, no problem, Pastor, because this is about reaching the person that doesn't know God. And, hey, I'll go to a different service, and I'll understand. I'll understand because this is the purpose of the church. Let me be clear. Nothing is easy about a church who loves lost people. That's really important because you have to constantly organize yourself in a way to do whatever it takes. In fact, we say that we'll do whatever it takes short of sin. We're not going to sin, but short of sin, we'll do whatever it takes to reach someone who doesn't know Christ. Why do we take so much time on Sunday to orient ourselves uh, and try to reach those people furthest from God, to communicate the Bible in such a way where lost people understand why do we do that? Because God loves people. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's very clear in, in scripture that uh, he thinks more about the lost things than he does the found things. All right? Read Luke, 8, Luke, Luke 15. He tells three stories. Jesus does about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. And every time, the story ends the same in every one. He left the one that was safe. And he went and found the one that was lost. And I believe that's how God really feels. Now, if, you, uh, if you've ever lost anything, you understand how important that is. I don't know if you've ever lost a kid. <laughs> uh, I did once. One time we were with my, uh, my family. We were all at uh, Espana's here in town. And my son was really small. And I thought he was with my brother. And my brother thought he was with me. And we get home. And I, I look at my brother and I go, where's my son? And he goes, oh, he was with you. And I'm like, no, 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 no. He was with you. And we're all like, ah. And so we call the Spaniards. And I go, yeah, we have him. He's right here. He's in the store playing with stuff. Uh, I don't even think he really knew it till later. He realized we had left him at the restaurant. It's, a, it's really terrifying. And for a moment, we're scrambling and rushing back down to get him. Because if you've ever lost something that's valuable to you, 
It matters a lot. And I believe that, that lost people matter a lot to God. Now, this is huge here at our Father's house. And if it becomes your home church today, it's critical that you understand this. That we're going to do everything we can to serve you. We're going to do everything we can to bless you. But our priority will always be reaching someone who doesn't know Christ. This is our mission. If you don't get that, you might hate it here. If you get that, you're going to love it here. You're going to want to get connected and be a part of it. So that makes the next part of this make a lot of sense. Look on page 25. Let me show you four values that all of us embrace in our Sunday services so that we can bless you and you can help us reach people. The first word in the blank you'll see there is the word celebration. Celebration. We believe that church should be fun. Our service should be fun on Sunday. I believe that's the kind of uh, service they had in the scripture. One of the things that we hear about uh, when people come and visit is it was so refreshing. We felt loved. We felt welcomed from the moment we walked in. And we felt God's presence. We want the whole Sunday experience for every person to be like a breath of fresh air. Like, man, I can breathe. In fact, I see people go to sleep. I don't get worried when people fall asleep in church. Because I understand that may be the only place they've been able to feel safe and to have peace is when they're in the presence of the Lord. I don't throw anything at them. Just let them sleep. And if we yell real loud, maybe they'll wake up at some point. This is the way church should be. David said this in Psalms 122. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I don't know about you. That wasn't the kind of church I grew up in. I was glad when it was over. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I was glad when they said, let's go eat lunch. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, everybody. I think every time we come to church, let's celebrate. It should be greater than any football game, any party. Because there's nothing better than to celebrate the goodness of God. And our church and our church service should be the best day of the week. So here's the second word. And that, that word is inspiration. We want it to be a celebration and we want it to be an inspiration. That means that the presence of God is what changes lives. We don't change lives. I can't change anybody's life. God's presence an encounter with God's presence can change a person's life forever. I believe that and I've seen it happen. That's why we pray. Because every person who comes to know God, they will have known Him because they had a powerful encounter with Him. We value God's presence. You need to know that. So the moment we come here, there's prayer going up. There are people who've prayed beforehand. The worship team is getting everything ready. Why? Because we want it to be inspiring. We want it to be encouraging. And we want you to encounter God's presence. Now the third word, that's the top of page 26. The word is preparation. This one I enjoy a lot. Preparation means we're going to prepare. We want to help people prepare for real life. Real life. Uh, you shouldn't go to church, listen to a message, and be a part of the services and walk away going, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. We want to always leave you with the action plan. What do you need to do this week? There should be some action that you can take. I believe that the Bible gives practical application for everyday li living in every part of life. Finances, relationships, raising kids, all of that stuff is addressed in the scripture. Uh, we're committed to bringing you messages that you can use on Monday. We want you to be able to use. We want to, real practical teachings that prepare you for life. The last thing we want to see happen in every service, and this is the fourth word here for your blanks, is salvation. Salvation. In every service, we're going to give people an opportunity to come to know Christ. I grew up in the Billy Graham generation where there was always altar calls, and no matter what the topic was, we're going to come back to the place where we say, if anybody doesn't know Jesus, today's your day. What better day to start your journey with Him. Know Him as Lord and Savior. Let Him fill you with His power. And I say this because if you become a minister, a member, sorry, uh, which also a minister, <laughs> if you become a member of our Father's house today, and I become your pastor, and you decide, this is the church I want to connect to, I want you to realize that that's one of our primary fo focuses. If you want to join today, I want you to help me reach as many people for Jesus as humanly possible. And I want to show you how simple it is. Turn to page 27. Let me give you this simple teaching on how to share Christ with someone. 
Listen, here's the number one thing you need to know. Every one of us need to accept personal responsibility. This is one of the commands of Jesus. For us to go and share the gospel. Go and preach the gospel to every person. It doesn't mean preaching at them. It's about sharing your life. Look at this. And this may be the most direct thing you'll hear from me today. But you need to know that. You are God's plan for somebody. You are God's plan for somebody. I can't reach the people you know. Right? Because they don't know me. But they know you. And you can reach them. God wants to reach people through you. And so I want to help you and show you how easy it is. Number two. And it's just this easy. Build a personal relationship. Just build a relationship. That's what Jesus was so good at. He was able to connect. And he was able to get to know someone. And then he was able to correct. You can't correct without relationship. And it's important. People aren't looking for a theological debate. Get that. You may memorize a ton of scriptures and be able to argue anybody down. That's not even the point. People are looking for love. They want to be loved. Now that should take some of the pressure off, right? Because you don't have to have all the answers. You don't have to know all the Bible to be able to share God's love with somebody. People don't, they don't even care how much you know. They want to know how much you care. Super important. People aren't looking for debate. They're looking for love. And if you'll just love people, build relationship with them, you can reach people. Realize this is our responsibility. This is what God's called us to do is to build relationship with people. How do you do that? Number three, your personal story. Just write in the blank, your story. Your story is important. What God has done for you, it's not about quoting scriptures. It's about saying, hey, let me tell you what God has done in my life. That's going to be more powerful than anything that you're able to share when it comes to trying to quote or prove a point. Share what, hey, I was an eyewitness. I was there. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. I was bound, but now I'm free. Look at what God has done in my life. When you share your personal story, that is so powerful. Growing up, our approach to the church I grew up in, the, our approach was you'd go out there and tell everybody how wrong they are. Y'all going to hell. <laughs> if you don't change, you're going to hell. If you go, turn or burn, right? Well, that didn't do so much, right? And then we walk away going, well, we told them. We did our job, right? The Bible doesn't say to do that. In fact, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts. Not even Jesus came to condemn the world. He came that we might find life and have everlasting life through Him. The Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin. We are to share what God has done for us. That's what a witness means. You shall be witnesses unto me. That's what it says. What does a witness do? A witness simply tells what they've seen and heard. It tells what they've seen and heard. Their side of the story. Our job is not to tell somebody what they should do. Our job is to tell them what we, what, how God's changed our life. What we've seen and heard. Our job is to tell people. Can, can, you, tell the, can, you, look, can you tell the difference God's made in my life? You know, somebody who's known you for a while, you can ask that question. Can you see what God's done? They're going to be like, yeah, you've been different lately. One guy told me recently that on his job, people started saying, have you lost weight? What happened? Did you change your hair? What's going on? He said, man, I went through the Freedom Small Group, and it changed my life. I got set free. I got to know Jesus, and I got baptized. And they went, oh, okay, that's okay. What a testimony. It gives them hope for their own life, Right? You can say that. You can say, I don't have it all together and I'm certainly not perfect yet, but look what God is doing in me. Look at what He's doing in my life. Jesus said, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works so they can glorify God in heaven. That should be the result. So look for opportunities to tell your story. And the last one's super important. Number four, give a personal invitation. Now, I'm not just talking about an invitation to receive Christ. Now, that may actually happen. There have been many times where you lead people to Christ right in your own backyard or, you know, watching the game. They're over at your house, whatever. That's beautiful. But everybody can invite somebody to church. <laughs> Why don't you come with me? Listen, don't say no for them. You know the number one reason why people don't go to church? No one's invited them. In America, the number one reason why people say they don't attend a church is because no one's invited them. And it's hard to go to a new church by yourself. Right? 
So invite someone. Don't say no for them. You can tell them, hey, I go to second service. Let's go get coffee and then let's go to church. Or, or hey, let's go to first service and then go to lunch. I'll take you and buy you lunch, right? We can sit together. I'll tell you what's going to happen. Here's what's going to happen. When you bring them, I want to give you permission. When I say everybody, eyes closed, head bowed, right? And we get ready to pray. I give you permission to peep. And just look out and see. And if you see the hand of your friend go up, I want to tell you there's no greater joy when somebody you've been talking to, somebody you've been sharing your faith with, when they when they receive Christ. When they start to follow Jesus, man, there is no greater joy than leading someone to Christ. I want you to know that we're going to give them that opportunity. Come on, let's do this together. All right? Come on, somebody. Let's do this together. Now, I want to finish with this point about knowing God. And share with you other places uh, that you can join in in helping people know God. We have a very clean, clear plan that shares Christ in three places. And this is in your notes and we're going to talk about it. First, it's our city, our nation, and our world based off of Acts chapter 1 verse 8. You will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now that's important. On page 28 there in your notes it says... In Jerusalem, that refers to our city. That's where they were. This is what Jesus said. You're going to be witnesses. You're going to be my witnesses first in Jerusalem, where you are. That makes sense, doesn't it? That you start where you are. Let me just tell you that your first responsibility is your own house. Start in your home. Start in your neighborhood, right? In your city. Our Jerusalem is Los Banos. The west side, it's where we live. That's our place. It's our first responsibility, so what do we do about our local missions? We, are, we do outreach. We do feeding. We're helping feed uh, our elderly citizens. Uh, Alpha Pregnancy Center, uh, prison ministry, uh, our school of ministry, raising up leaders, uh, youth ministry, children's ministry. There's so many places. Men's groups, Band of Brothers, uh, women's group, TLC for women. There's all kind of places for you to connect. That's what's happening in our city. Number two is our Judea and Samaria. That's the greater region. So that would be our nation. So Jerusalem's where you live, and Judea and Samaria would be the country. And so our nation. So we're called first to where we are, and then to our nation. We believe the best way to reach people for Christ and to reach the United States of America is through life-giving local churches. I'm not talking dead churches. I'm talking about life-giving churches. We need more life-giving churches. Some people say that as many as 7,000 churches close their doors every year in the United States. So what do we want to do? We want to plant new life-giving churches with a plan to help people grow in God and become followers of Jesus. And we want to strengthen as many existing churches as we can. Now the third area of, of responsibility on page 29, Jesus told us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth. What is that? That's our world. Our local city, local missions, our national missions, our country, and then world missions, international missions. We stream live worldwide every Sunday. So we are preaching to the world every Sunday, reaching. We're praying for lost people to get saved in service, praying for people to get saved on the online reach. We're praying for churches being planted that will bring life-giving churches to communities, praying for our missions worldwide. We support Moms Against Hunger and our missions around the country. We support new church plants around this nation. And so we're praying, God, send your presence, send your spirit that people may know you. Pray. I want to encourage you in your daily prayer time to pray. For our churches. Number two. Is I'd love for you to get involved. We must go. Go into our community. Go into these places. You can't do anything until you go. This is so important. Get involved. When we have a serve day. Jump on board. We do it once a year. Where we just like ants. We just scatter out from the church. And we're just fixing and cleaning and helping and doing. Just what are we doing? Hey we love our city. We're here to serve. That's what we're about. You don't have to do it all the time, but it'll change you forever once you start doing it. That's how we do it. That's why, and that's, that's what we'll help you do. Number three, when God speaks to you, definitely, you need to give of your time, of your talent, and your treasure. Not just your time and your talent, but also of your treasure. You will hear a lot of vision of things that we could do. 
But here's what I want you to do. Every time you hear me say, this is what we're about to go do. The church, we're about to do this. We need your help. I want you to pray and ask God, God, what do you want me to give? Is it time? Is it from my talent? Or am I supposed to write a check? Am I supposed to help them get this done? All I need you to do is say, Lord, show me. And then listen. Listen to God. Ask Him. And when God directs you, give. This is under our very first purpose. We want every person to know God. Our second purpose is on page 31. We want people to find freedom. I want you to know God. We want you to find freedom. That happens in small groups. So right there in that blank on page 31, write small groups. Find freedom happens in small groups. Our church service alone aren't going to change your life. Hello. (laughs) But relationships will. Let me, let me just prove this to you. You probably can't remember the last couple of messages I preached. You, you definitely like, oh, it was good, Pastor. Yeah, it was real good. Right? People say that all the time. It was good, Pastor. What you preached Sunday was good. And I'm like, what did I preach? Uh, uh, it's from the Bible. <laughs> it's amazing. It's hard for us to retain stuff. That's why we encourage you to take notes. Right? But listen, you can tell me of the last ten people that's e- impacted your life, either for bad or for good. You can reaccount those stories, right? <laughs> because it's those relationships that in- impacted you. Not information. Relationships change your life. And it's really important because I believe that's how freedom happens. You need a dynamic small group of people. That's the biblical model, Acts 20, 20. The early, churches had, the early church had temple worship, but the real ministry took place from house to house in the community. That's how a small group helps you. The Bible says this. Look, look at this. It's important. James 5, 16. Confess your faults to one another. And then pray for that person that you might be healed. Pray for one another that you might be healed. Now, as comfortable as that may make you feel, all of us have something, including myself, that we need to be healed from. Hmm. All of us. There's hurts. Stuff that's messed up. We all got issues. The question is, is how are you going to deal with those issues? Are you just going to pretend, put on a big smile? How are you doing, blessed and highly favored? Or are you going to say, hey, I need somebody with me in the trenches. I need somebody watching my back. I need somebody I can be accountable to. I need a prayer partner. I need somebody that will come into agreement that things are going to change in my life. That's what we do here at our Father's house. We don't want you to just show up on Sunday and, and give a little bit, clap your hands and go home and forget about church. We want you to be connected and in a relationship. The Bible doesn't say it is God only that changes your life. It happens when you're in relationship because you're part of the body. You're part of the body. And when somebody prays with you, they walk with you through it, we all need that. So back to your notes. Small groups provide three things. Number one, it provides us a place to connect with others. So when we have a small group, it's not just about the Bible study. It may be a great one. It may be simply about connecting. It's important that you get to know believers who love what you love and do what you do. You need that relationship. You need a place to connect. Some people say, church, but pastor, this church is too big. (laughs) The truth is, every church is too big if you're not connected. No matter how big it is. If you're not connected, it's too big. Everyone needs a place to connect. You need a place to connect within a big church where everybody knows your name. Right? Everybody needs a place where everybody knows your name. Here's the thing. Because the bigger church gets, it has to get bigger. Right? The church needs to get bigger and bigger because that's our first purpose, to help people know God. Because heaven and hell is real. We believe in a real hell. We believe in a real heaven. And because lost people matter. So we want the church to always be growing. But it also has to get smaller because you matter. You need to be connected somewhere. So that's what happens in small group. Number two, what you need, the second thing, is a small group provides a place to protect. The the blank there, the word is protect. You need a place where people know when you're struggling. Man, that's important. Because everybody's got a blind spot. And that's why they call it a blind spot is because you can't see it. If you could see it, we wouldn't call it a blind spot. Everybody has a blind spot. And you need somebody that can say, hey, hey, pastor, you know, uh, you got something between your teeth. That little spot right there, you got 
I don't know what you had for lunch, broccoli? Or something. Somebody that's honest enough to say and not just leave you walking around with a big old thing stuck between your teeth. You need somebody that loves you enough that says, man, I'm going to risk it. You may not like this, but you've got something in between your teeth. Right? You need somebody that loves you that much. We need to have accountability partners. Hey, buddy, I got your back. I'm going to cover you. Let's be real, real honest. Let's just stop it already and quit acting like we've got it all together and we're so spiritual that nobody else knows how to live like... Come on. Get in a small group and be honest and just say, hey, man, I'm dealing with some stuff. You know, I need some help with my marriage. I need, some, I need to join the financial group. I need to go to Financial Peace University with Pastor Dave because, man, I messed up. I've got credit card debt out my eyeballs, right? Some more place you can get real. Let me tell you, that's a great small group. Pastor Dave will sit down with you and help you organize a budget. We've had people get out of debt in seven, eight months around here like that. It's amazing how quick they got out of debt because they made it their intentional focus. And with Pastor Dave's help, they did it because they joined a small group. The third thing a small group gives us is a place to grow together. This is important because we all need to grow, right? We all need to grow. The Bible calls growing discipleship. That's what it means, discipline followers, discipleships. Real discipleship happens when in the discussion process with other people, <laughs> somebody's able to say, hey, this is my perspective. And you go, wow, that was great. I, didn't under- I never saw it like that. You'll grow faster if you're connected with other people. Turn to page 32 and 33. We've got some information here to show you how our small groups work. This is important for you to know. Like, like this, for instance, number one, our groups is what we call free market. We call them free market, which means uh, that they gather for many reasons. <laughs> our groups, they don't always have to be a Bible study. We have running groups and I believe that the groups are going to continue to expand around here. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Bible study because it's about connection. Uh, and I, I really love all the groups that we have. The reason is because when you value relationship, it's not about what the group does. It's about the relationships you're building, right? So you can have a bowling group. Why not? A softball group. I'd love to see that one happen. Why? Because you need to connect. You need a place. To, you can be protected. And you can protect, and you need a place to grow in that environment. And yeah, of course, you can have those groups. And here's the thing. We want to pray for each other. That's what it's about. We're going to pray for each other and, and cover each other. In fact, a lot of people might come to Christ just through your group. You start a group about what you love. At one point, we had a knitting group, and I was shocked. There was like 15 people sitting around in a circle knitting. I'm like, ah, I'd be crawling out of my skin. <laughs> I don't knit. But the people who did it absolutely loved it. And they had a great time and they got to be friends. And they connected. And lifelong friendships came out of that knitting group. You're, you're growing together. You're discipling together. It's important. Uh, you find out what uh, another person's issues are. <laughs> you go out and start competing on a bowling team. And don't you'll see somebody's attitude right quick, right? Amen. <laughs> sure you can. People get involved. That's what free market means. People get involved with this topic, the subject, or whatever they like to do. Uh, and so there are a lot of different groups. Second, we always meet in semesters. They start three times a year, then we take a break three times a year. Thirteen weeks, six weeks, thirteen weeks, three times a year. And so we follow the natural rhythm of life. And it follows the school year. Because when your kids are out, you're busy, right? Right? And so we take a break, usually when kids are out. Not all groups do that. Like a running group or a workout group, they may continue right on. That's totally up to the leader and, and the group and what they want to do. And so it's important. Uh, number three in your notes tells you how to join a group. And uh, they're going to give you some number, uh, a number and information that will help you. And I want to encourage every, every person to join a small group. Uh, and there is some training. If you want to start a group, who knows? You may be starting the next big thing here. We've got training for that. All right, let's go on to our third purpose. Our first purpose is for people to know God. Our second purpose is we want people to find freedom. Our third purpose is we want people to discover their purpose. What is your divine purpose? And we help people discover their purpose in what you're in right now. And that is growth track. So write that down. That's in the blank. Part of discovering your purpose is growth track. Amen. So this is the four classes that you're in right now. And this is why it exists. 
And step one is so that every person can follow. The word there is follow. Follow who? Jesus. We want every person to follow Jesus. Not a person, not a denomination. Follow Jesus. Because everything begins with a relationship with God. So that's, that's what this class is about. And uh, if you were here last week, you, we talked about that. We want you to follow him in a vibrant, life-giving relationship. If you've never been baptized, we want to help you take that step and go public with your faith. Step two on page 35 is what you're in right now. And so write down this word, and that word is connect. Connect. Now, I don't need to explain that. You're in the class right now. But you need to connect. Connect to what? Connect to the church. Connect to a small group. You need to do life together with somebody. Our hope for you today is if you decide to join our Father's house, uh, that you will decide, I want to be part of a small group that grows together. We need you to connect uh, in those places. I'd love for you to come back uh, for the third step in the next class. And this is where it gets really fun. It's about discovery. About, to, about discover. Connect and then discover. Uh, third, uh, the third class is such a blast. We actually do a uh, personality profile and a spiritual gifts test. We start looking in to what is your design? What is the natural talents that God has given you? And how does that manifest? Because I believe when you're doing what you're created to do, there's no better joy. There's no greater way to live your life. And so we want to help you find that in the kingdom of God. And then finally, we want everyone to serve. That next blank is serve. All of us need to serve. Save people, serve people. God didn't call you in to be a part of his family, to be a part of the body of Christ, just for you to take up space. You're to be connected with somebody else and serve somebody else and to give back into the body because you have something nobody else has. You are unique like that. Serve a V team. Camera, producing, audiovisual. All of those things, uh, website design, serve as a leader, serve at, on, on the worship team, serve in the parking lot, serve on the security team, uh, on, the, on the, uh, our father's kids team, uh, teaching our youth or our children, uh, be a part of the dream team. I mean, there's so many places. You really need to hear this. Jesus said that when you find your place around your design, when you serve in that place, that's where real joy happens. The biggest joy of your life is not going to be making money. Make it, it's not going to be making money. Some people think it is. It's not. The biggest joy in life is not another vacation. <laughs> it's not even when your team wins the championship. Real joy comes from the fact that you found your purpose and your life is making a difference for someone. There's no greater feeling than in the world than to lay your head down at night thinking, I did my part to make a difference in the world today. And what I did helped someone. It changed someone's life. I need to tell you, it gives real meaning to every part of your life. And I really want to lead you to that place. I want you to discover that. And if you'll complete this with me, complete growth track, I really believe you're going to find that kind of direction. And that's when we can all go top of page 36 in your notes. That is finally to make a difference. We make a difference here uh, at our Father's house according to the gifts that God has put into us. We call that the dream team. So you hear me talking about the dream team? There are people that don't wear blue shirts that are on the dream team because they're serving a different capacity. There are those wearing the shirts and those that are not. But there's a place on the dream team. So right there in your blank is dream team. I need you to dream. I want you to dream. That's why we call it the dream team. I want you to dream because I always believe that the greatest churches in the world don't look like their pastor. They look like the people. Amen? The church should look like the people of the community. I really believe that. I think it should look like you, so I want you to dream. I think the ministries that we do here should look like you because it should be you working the ministry. I'm here to equip you to do the work of the ministry, not do the work of the ministry. A lot of churches you go and the pastor does it all. I don't do that here. We want you to do the work of the ministry. We want to help equip you and find out what that gifting is. That's when you can make the most difference. That's what the dream team is really all about. We want you to dream. We want, there, I believe there's a dream inside of every person that God has placed there. When you live that out, you're making a difference in people's lives. And that's what really changes the world. It not only changes the world, but it also changes you. On page 37, I want you to write this down. These are three things that we believe about you. 
here at our Father's house, we believe this about our members. First, every member is a minister. Every member is a minister. Most people think it's the pastor's job to be the minister, but the Bible says the exact opposite. Isn't that amazing how we've gotten that wrong? The Bible says that pastors are supposed to equip the people in the church to be the ministers. <laughs> Some people call it, well, that's my preacher. <laughs> I always say, I, I ain't your preacher. <laughs> Maybe you grew up like that. You know, you just you called your pastor the preacher. My job is not just to preach. My job is to equip you. You're the preacher. Your life is the one that's preaching out there. You're the minister. Amen. And I want you to understand that ministry lives in you. And I don't, I don't know uh, if you'll ever stand behind the podium and preach on Sunday. But I know on your job, you're, you're given a message. I know in your home, in your neighborhood, you're definitely given a message. You're telling a message about Jesus and about what he's done in your life, either good or bad. But I know you can do many, many things. You can run a camera. You can help greet people. You can serve people in some capacity. And I want you to know that when you do that, you're preaching. And in fact, listen, I tell our team over in our father's kids, I can't even do what I do on Sunday without you. Think about it. You got to have a place for your kids to be safe and be taught the word and be growing in their faith. That's why you're able to come in and sit and enjoy the service on Sunday. And that's because there's a team over there that love our kids enough to give their time and their effort, their talent, to serve them and to serve you and to serve the vision of our Father's house. I can't do what I do without them. That's how important. So many parts, everything. That could be said about almost everything here. We can't do what we do without you. That's why we believe that, that every task is important. Every task is important. In other words, there are no small roles. Every part of the body of Christ is important. And I want you to understand that. We believe that every member is a 10 in some area. You may not have discovered it yet, but I believe you're a 10 in some area. There's a place that you can be awesome. You're going to be amazing. And we want you to find that out. Come back to the next step. We're going to try to help you find that out. Join the dream team and get on board. We're going to give you a quick orientation. You're going to meet some great people. There's some paperwork to fill out. Uh, we call it an application, but we want to help you connect and get on the team. We're going to have a conversation with you. And here's the great thing about our Father's House. We, are, we connect you with our Dream Team Coordinator. So if you get put in a place somewhere, you don't get lost forever. Some churches, you disappear. We don't do that here. If, you need, if you're there for a while and you're like, hey, this is not fitting for me, you go back and talk to the Dream Team Coordinator. They will help you find another opportunity. Or, hey, I want to do this for a little while, then I want to change and do something else. You know what? That's completely fine. We want you to find where you can be the most productive for God, working in his kingdom. Amen? This is our purpose and our plan here at our church. I want you to see that. We want people to know God. We want people to find freedom. We want them to discover their purpose. We want to make them a difference. Now, I'm getting ready to close the class. But before I do, there are a couple bits of information that I think you need to know before you become a member. One of our things that we talk about here is about church government. Now, I'm on page 38, so let me just read this paragraph to you. We believe believers who invest their heart, time, and family, and finance in building their local church deserve to have confidence in its leadership. People are looking for leaders to conduct themselves with integrity, respect when making decisions that affect their lives. So we have church government that's made up of seven Members we call the Advisory Council, the Church Advisory Council. And you need to know this. We are first uh, guided, the church is guided by, by the pastors. That's the blank there. Pastoral staff. That's, I'm the senior pastor of the pastoral staff. And so we make the day-to-day, -day, in and out decisions for the church. We lead the church as shepherds. We take servant leadership to heart. We take it seriously. We do not rule over God's people. We are here to serve. We are the ones serving the church. We don't rule the church like a king. We lead like a shepherd. And a shepherd is always in front of the sheep. He always goes before the sheep. And the lambs of God follow. Amen? We're servants of the church. We understand that, that, dyna that, dy that dynamic. We understand that dynamic here. But it needs to be uh, in place. So you understand 
that leading is done with a level of accountability, especially in the area of finances. You hear horror stories. We have the advisory council. The next blank uh, there is in, on page 39. That's why we have the advisory council. Sorry. That's the next blank there on 39. They don't tell us how to spend the money. They make sure that we do it right and we keep it in accordance to our bylaws. And I am the chairman of the advisory council. The advisory council also oversee and ensure that everything is done in order and according to the bylaws of the church. We're grateful to have a great team in place to help the pastoral staff lead us into the future that God has for us. The third level of accountability is, our, is what we call our overseers. We're strengthened by overseers. That's the blank. And that is what our organization, Independent Christian Churches International, ICCI, is to us. That is Bishop Gregory Holly and Dr. Lonnie Rex. That's the place they hold in our life. That's who we're accountable to. And so if there's ever a time when I need counsel, I'm calling them, right? They're coming in and they're helping me. Now, they don't have authority to make the decisions. They're just here to support and help us. It's so important. I believe everyone needs to be under authority. You're not an island. And you need somebody who you'll listen to, that you're submitted to, to say, hey, if you see something in my life that needs corrected, you have the privilege and the right, and I'm asking you to tell me. Everybody needs to be under authority, somebody watching out over you. This group is our apostolic elders. I mean, they're, they're like fathers to me or brothers to me. They're there to cover me and protect me and encourage me. And if I need correction, hey, they're the ones who are able to say, hey, Pastor Doug, we need to have a talk. We need to help you stay on track here. They're, they're as senior leaders to us, and they help us through that process. They're there to strengthen us. This is our government, and it's the same government used by thousands of churches across America. The last thing, and we're going to close, is on page 40. This is our unique approach to finances, and this is so important for you to know. I believe we have a great approach, a life-giving approach to it. We've determined to keep this area something that is so life-giving, we want you to understand it. At, at our Father's house, there isn't pressure to give. Honestly, here's the thing. God didn't call me to raise money. He called me to build a church. In fact, I told the Lord when we launched this thing, I am not going to stand on Sunday, every Sunday, begging for money, trying to pay the bills. I am not going to do it. And our goal is that every year we set aside a margin now, we don't spend all the money that comes in because we set aside margin. Just like you have to do it at your house, you have to save. If you're ever going to have any future, you have to put aside money. And so we put aside a, uh, 10% every year as a margin. <clears throat> that means I don't want to ever have to stand on Sunday and like have to take an offering that my life depends on. Like we've got to turn off the lights if we don't raise an offering. I don't want to ever have to do that. And we want to be positioned when God gives opportunity in the future. So we started saving. We started putting money aside. And we will continue to do that. Uh, there's always a need. And you, listen, and a lot of churches do it. You can spend every dollar that comes in the church because there's always a need. But if you're going to have a future, you have to plan for it. God told us to be wise like the ant. So we set aside a portion of our budget. We don't spend it all and save it. And we believe God's going to give us an opportunity in the future. And we're going to be able to just write the check. Because we've got it there in savings. We want to be wise and diligent. What does that mean? And I say this often. We will grow and go as the people of our father house, Father's house give and serve. So it depends on you. I'm not going to go buy a big building and put the church in debt and be on Sunday every morning going, y'all got to give. I don't know if we're going to stay here anymore. I don't know if we're going to keep going. I am not going to do that. We're going to raise the money, and as God gives the opportunity, we're going to go and build it if you're ready to go with us. I can't do this by myself. We want to have margin. We want to be responsible. We want to be ready if there's, God gives an opportunity or if there's a tragedy. We want to be able to help. So if we budget well and we live under our means, then we'll be positioned for opportunity when it arises we're not going to pressure you, and every, I'm not going to get up every Sunday and be going, oh, we've got to raise $500 this week, or we're in trouble. Not going to do it. We're going to come and, and, and give you the opportunity, and I will share with you vision, what I believe God is saying for us to do, and I'll ask you to get on board with that vision. I want you to pray and ask the Lord what He wants you to do and what He wants you to give in that time. Listen, I want this to be clear. We always have more vision than we have money. Man, I've got a vision so big. What God's told me to do in this region is so big, 
we definitely don't have the money to do it yet. And so there's always more vision. I want you to know that. But we don't lead by doing it ahead of the finances. We don't lead, lead that way. And, we're not, and then go and begging people to pay for it. No. As we grow and serve, we'll, we'll move that forward as you give and serve. We want to build a new campus. We want to buy property and build a new church. We want it so you don't have to search for a parking spot on Sunday. And walk two blocks sometimes. Amen. We would love to do that. But we're going to do it at the pace of your giving. Your generosity. And we're not going to be under pressure. We're not going to pressure you. We're going to ask you to do this. If this church becomes your church, be faithful in your giving so that we can do what God has called us to do. You give as generously as you can. And I promise you we'll be good stewards of it. I give you my word. And we're going to do it frugally. We're going to do it with full disclosure and integrity. And I want you to know when I raise an offering for something, when that offering is designated, we don't use it for any other purpose. If our, if our purpose changes, we come back and we will tell the whole congregation, we raised that money for that, but our purpose has changed and we're going to do this instead because we, we're never going to do it without your knowledge. We're going to do it with honesty. We're going to make a difference for God in this earth. May His kingdom come for the glory of the Lord. Amen? I don't like gimmicks. I do believe God's system of giving is threefold. Okay? I'm never going to sell Miracle Spring water. <laughs> I'm just not going to do it. Uh, you know, we'll do fundraisers from time to time, but that's not how we raise money for the kingdom. I believe God has a threefold system, and that is, number one, that we tithe. Those of us who've made our Father's house, this is our home church, this is our storehouse, we give 10% to build and support the local church. That's the very first level. And let me tell you, Jesus always takes it a step higher. That's an Old Testament level. Actually, it was before the, old, uh, before the law, definitely before the law. God, Jesus came, comes and he, he says, I, I want everything. I want your whole life. How about that one, right? But we start with there. Start with a percentage. Put God first. We believe in the, the law of first things. That the first portion belongs to the Lord. And when you honor God with the first, he's going to bless the rest. Amen. He's going to bless the rest. Secondly, we give offerings. When God speaks to us, this is over and above our tithes. So the 10% is the very beginning margin. The tithe already belongs to the Lord. It's really not even giving. It's returning. Hello, somebody. Because it doesn't belong to us. The Bible says the first tenth belongs to the Lord. Offerings is what we want to do because God has blessed us above and beyond. And all you have to do is listen to the Lord. He will tell you what to do. The third way that the Bible describes how people can give is People who have the gift of giving. And I do believe we're going to have people like that. We already do have some people like that. It's the gift of giving. It means like that's their purpose. God has uniquely give, gifted them with the gift of giving. And that means they're called to make money to fund the kingdom of God. It's their calling. And I believe that there are going to be some, te- pe- there are going to be some key people who God is bringing massive resources into their life. So that we can fulfill the purpose of God in this region. If you think you have the gift of giving. Which means God has blessed you to fund kingdom projects. We would love for you to join what we call the legacy team. That's coming soon. I want to put together that team of people. Who we pray together. We strategize together about the future. And we believe God's going to bless us. So let me close with this. At our Father's house, we practice tithing for the support of Christ's body, the church, as God commands the blessing and recognize that 10% of our income is the biblical giving standard. We believe many people love to give, but they need to have the confidence and the method and the purposes used by the organizations in which they give. Therefore, there are a great number of people who are willing to give. They just need to see honesty and integrity and general spiritual values reflected in their, their church's lifestyle, right? Giving of tithes and offerings is worship to Jesus. It's our worship. And it's an expression of the relationship between us and God. Funds are not income to the church. It is worship. And it is not considered a business transaction. It is an expression of gratitude to God. So let's close with this. On page 41, if you've liked what you've heard today, we're asking our, our members who join our, our, our church family. You come on board. And our Father's house becomes your church. And I become your pastor. 
We ask you to sign and agree with our membership covenant. Here's how it goes. I've received Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I have to, you have to be a Christian, right? <laughs> uh, and you've got to be in agreement with what you've heard today. And I feel like I'm led by the Spirit. The Lord's calling me a part of our Father's house. And I'm, com- I'm going to commit to doing what the pastor's asking us to do. Number one, I need you to protect the unity of the church. How? By acting in love toward other members. By refusing to gossip. Hello. Finally, play whatever part. Join in. Be what God has called you to be. Do what God's called you to do. Fulfill your purpose. If we're all doing a serve day, let's do it together. Right? This is what we value. We want to do it together. Let's join in. The church values that kind of unity. I believe Jesus prayed for it. That we may be one as he and the Father are one. There's strong spiritual support for these statements. Here we go. Number two. On page 42. The responsibility of my church. Here's how it's go. I'm to pray for my church. I'm to pray for its growth. This is my responsibility. Pray for me. I need your prayers. As the pastor, I need your prayers. I need to know how to lead. I need God's wisdom. Pray for the unchurched to come and to follow Christ. That's a big deal to us. Listen, here's what I want you to understand too. Everybody is a greeter. We welcome everybody. So whether you're on the dream team or not, you're always a greeter. When you see somebody new, smile and shake their hand and welcome them. You automatically become a greeter. Help them find what they need to be. Number three, I will serve the ministry of my church. How, how do we do that? Come back to the next class and discover your gift and talent. Uh, let, uh, let us equip you. Let us help you find that. And then let's just serve the socks off of people. Let's, I want our city to go, man, I don't know what we would do if they were not here. Seriously, there are places where churches close and the city doesn't even notice. I would want our city to be going, oh man, I don't know what we're going to do if our Father's house is not in our city. That's how big of an impact. I want you to support the testimony of our church by attending, by joining a small group, by living a godly life, right? By giving regularly and supporting the mission. Not just talking about your money, of your ideas, of your time, of your talent, of your treasure. Here's why. Because this becomes your house. This becomes your church. These are your chairs now. This is your building now. It's not mine. This is our church. Right? Let's make the best. Let's make it the best place on earth. Let's make it the, not Disneyland. Let it be the happiest, the best place on earth is to come to our Father's house. So before I turn it over to your host today, let me just pray. Father, I thank you for this opportunity to share what I'm passionate about. This is your church. I believe the church is the hope of the world. And so, Father, I pray that this passion goes deep down into every person that's hearing this today. Give us direction. Help us to know what to do. If this is the place you're calling us to, let us say yes. May every person grow and flourish. Holy Spirit, speak to them right now. Lord, as they continue their journey next week, come back and discover their purpose. And ultimately, Father, may they make a difference. Let each and every one of us make a difference. May we always bring you glory. May we never bring you shame. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks for coming. We love you. God bless you.